Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this week. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. We have another great session for you. Tina Bean is back in the house. We will be saying hello to her shortly. Uh, as you are signing in, please locate your control bar. That is at your bottom of your at the bottom of the web browser window. And that is where you will find the chat, the Q&A and the live transcript options. So for the chat, if you intend to use the chat today, and we hope that you do because we love to hear from you, please make sure that you select all panelists and attendees from the drop down to ensure that all of us participating today can see what it is you have to say. Be aware that your uh, little menu there might say panelists, and then the other option might say everyone. Uh, you want to select everyone or you want to select panelists and attendees. It just depends on which version of Zoom that you have. Um, but. If you don't do that, then only a few of us see your comment and that is not any fun. So choose everyone or choose all panelists and attendees. If you have questions either for Saddleback or for Tina, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A area and we will address those just as soon as we can. And if you would like to take advantage of subtitles, please select live transcript from the control bar and then click show subtitles. We'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. We're on Twitter. Just a reminder, follow us, uh, say hello. Even if you are watching the recording, feel free to uh, hop onto Twitter, let everybody know that you joined us for this great learning session today and that you learned something new, hopefully. All right, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Let's say hi to Tina. Hello, how are you, friend? I'm good, and I'm just remembering I forgot to tweet about this today. So Oh, well, guess... that's okay. All right. She's tweeting right now. Great. Thank I'm you so much. My phone. I was like, I'll do it right now. <laughs> okay, perfect. So if you all could go to the chat and select everyone from the drop down menu or all panelists and attendees, whichever yours says, uh, let everybody know um, where you're joining us from today. We always love to see who's here. Thank you, Susanna and Melba for joining us. We're happy to see you. The numbers are slowly starting to creep up. People are uh, signing in. Tomball ISD is here, Chicago. Hi, Vivian, nice to see you. Robert Kim is here, welcome. All right, the Santiago is here. Pflugerville ISD, welcome. Louisiana, welcome everybody. This is going to be a great session where you're going to learn some really uh, quick tools to use for uh, bell ringers. Huntsville ISD, welcome. That's just north of Houston, I believe. Yeah, some of my oh, favorite right. people are in Huntsville. That's um, right. You know, not like necessarily there within the prison system, but professors at Sam Houston State, just to clarify. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, my uncle was a Thank you for that. There. Yeah, just to clarify. Oh. Okay, good. All right. We've got New Brunswick and Lawton, Oklahoma. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, keep at it. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, Let's actually talk to Tina about a special someone who registered for this webinar. I don't know if she's going to be joining us live, but y'all, I have this great story for you. Listen, listen to this. I already told Tina this, so she already knows, but we wanted to share it. So um, Mrs. Cowan registered for the webinar today. And guess what? Mrs. Cowan is Tina's fifth grade teacher. And she, here, she just commented, I have all the chills and all the. Oh, feels. she's here. Hi, Sherry. Yeah. Oh, she, she has, has a class. Just a second. Okay. Yeah, she has a class. She but. says, I taught Tina in fifth grade. Oh, my gosh. Like, yeah, oh. it, yeah she's amazing. Oh, I can't. I can't. I know. Um, no, Miss Cowan is the best, y'all. And I became a fifth grade teacher with no experience teaching and no one in my family who'd been a teacher. So I was like, what would Miss Cowan do? Like for the whole first year, I was like, what would, what would Miss Cowan do in this situation? Um, and then I was like, I bet Miss Cowan, like she must have had some kind of coping mechanism. She must have had chocolate or something that I didn't know about. Cause she was always so peaceful and so calm with us. And I, I thought the whole first year, how did she do it? So it's awesome to see her show back up. Cause she's my oh, favorite. And that, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And I'm so, so grateful to Liz y'all. Cause Liz knows me well enough that she texted it to me before she texted it to me and let me know because Miss Cowan uh, left a question uh, because I would have full on ugly cried like right now <laughs> if she had surprised me with it I'm not good uh, with anything with surprises or really emotions uh, so that was perfect <laughs> for me to give me time to process because I did full on cry I felt like a fifth grader again like hearing that your fifth grade teacher is proud of you is like that's huge I'm very yeah. excited so thank you yeah. Ms. Cowan 
Miss Cowan, thank you so much for sending that note. That just made everybody's day at Saddleback too. I messaged a bunch of people at Saddleback. I'm like, look at this. Yeah. Tina, Tina's teacher is joining us and she left a lovely note and yes. it just warms my heart. Okay, um, it's about time to get started. But before we do, I just wanna say um, welcome A-Leaf ISD. Welcome Indonesia, thank you for joining us. Whoa. And welcome Esperanza from Carrollton Farmers Branch. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I love to see all these familiar names. Oh, yeah, excellent. but also from Hawaii. And I know that uh, Robert Kim, I think you're in, he's in New York. So mm -hmm. Robert's, really at, Robert's yeah, here. Y'all yeah. know I have a hard time getting out of Texas. And so uh, I love to see that y'all are joining us from all over the world because I'm just here. <laughs> awesome, all right, well. Let's get started. Our topic today is building language through bell ringers. A straightforward topic. It's always good to have more activities and ideas in the toolkit so that we can help our students build language in those moments that we have um, before class or maybe right before the end of class. I don't know, it depends on how you wanna do that. But uh, so Tina's here to talk to us about that. And Tina is an educational consultant with Sidelets Education. For those of you who aren't familiar with Sidelets, check them out, lots of great uh, books and professional development, lots of great resources. So um, she has tons of experience, but among her previous educational roles, we have teacher, social studies teacher, uh, in a bilingual classroom, a bilingual program coordinator, secondary ESL, secondary ESL facilitator, and she is author of the book Teaching Studies to Teaching Social Studies. This one, Teaching Social Studies to ELLs. So, uh, before I continue tripping over my words, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Tina. Thank you for being here, <laughs> and um, I'll be here to uh, assist and jump back on at the end for questions. So. Take it away. Perfect. I'm going to take away the screen sharing options then, if you don't mind. Go for it. Let's take them for myself. All right. There we go. All right. Does that look right for you, Liz? Looks good. All right. Let's do it. Howdy, y'all. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here for being here today or for being, I think it's even more impressive if you go back and watch this later, because that's always my goal is to, I sign up for these and I can't make it on time. And then I say, I'm going to watch them and I don't necessarily do it. So kudos to you if you're watching this later, because that's really, really impressive. Um, but I'm really grateful for those of you who can be with us today to talk about those first few minutes of class and why they can be so powerful and why they're so important. So if you want to uh, engage with us on social media about this session, the only thing uh, that I have to offer you for myself personally is the Twitter, because that's all that I use, and I'm not very good at it, as we saw as this session began. Uh, but I do encourage you to follow Saddleback and me and my colleagues at Sidelets, because I have some coworkers who are just awesome at making the most of social media and share wonderful things on Twitter. So. Um, that's the information there on the title slide if you want to tweet about today's session uh, or hang out with us after. I'll try to check that. All right. And please do use the chat throughout the session, whether I'm asking you to respond about something specific or just to share your own perspective. I would love to see us sharing lots of resources and ideas and collaborating uh, with each other while we have this opportunity. It's so rare to get to interact with people from all over the world on a specific topic like warm-ups or bell ringers. So I would love to see us use that chat uh, and make the most of our time together. So feel free to share ideas and your own experience and perspective. I love it when the chat is its own ecosystem and there's stuff going on in there that um, I don't see necessarily. So please do use that throughout the session. And uh, Liz will keep me, I'll check in with you a couple of times and she'll keep me up to date on the questions. Uh, she'll also share with me She's really good about if I need to clarify something or if I need to go back or if there's a question in the moment that needs to be addressed, please do interrupt me, uh, Liz, and let me know if there's a question that's germane to what we're doing or it needs to be clarified for directions or something like that. Okay, so let's just jump right into it, y'all. Uh, bell ringers are also known as warm ups. They have a pretty general form and function to them. Basically, a bell ringer should not take more than 10 minutes. The bell rang many, many moons ago if it's 15 minutes in and you're still doing this. That's not what a bell ringer is. Uh, the bell ringer takes two to 10 minutes maybe. 
and it does not require teacher input or assistance while it's being done. You may have to be involved to give directions, but during the activity, it is something that is not teacher assisted. Uh, it is something that students do independently in pairs, uh, in groups, but not with teacher supports. This is not a direct teach type of strategy. Um, a bell ringer can be used to reprise previous content, but if it is something that we're reviewing from the past, we can't require background knowledge. So what I mean is, if it's April and I want to do a bell ringer to remind kids of something we did in October, my bell ringer has to include all of the context they need to be successful. I can't assume that they remember anything from October because I need them to be able to do the bell ringer independently. And if they don't, if they don't remember anything from October, then they're not gonna be able to do the activity. Does that make sense? So if I'm using the bell ringer to reprise previous content, I definitely need to make sure I'm giving them all the context they need to be successful. It's also a great time to introduce new concepts. Uh, we just wanna make sure that it doesn't require any background knowledge at all, okay? All right, so we're gonna get into a few strategies in a second. Uh, we talked about in this title, bell ringers to build language. So bell ringers themselves, can be a form of scaffolding. So they are themselves a form of scaffolding, which I just wanna take a minute right now, like just have my coffee and talk to you about scaffolding because this is something that many of us in education pretend that we understand and few of us actually do. And when I was first teaching, and I told y'all, I didn't know anything about anything. I just tried to be Miss Cowan and do what she did. Uh, but it was hard to remember because I was, you know, a fifth grader the last time I had observed her uh, myself. So I was trying to guess what she would do. And I was also relying a lot on my partner across the hall who taught uh, fifth grade social studies and language arts with me. And she was my partner that I planned with. So she wasn't my partner teacher, but we planned together. And I relied on her for everything. And I had already asked her 50,000 questions uh, since the school year had begun. We were a few weeks in, I think, um, and someone came into my room from the district to do a walkthrough. And they said, how's it going with scaffolding? And I had never heard that word before in terms of education. And I had barely heard of it in terms of how you see in this image. I knew that it existed for like tall buildings, but I'm from a small town where we didn't have multi-story buildings, really. Uh, there was one big tall building in town uh, that they didn't ever do any repairs to the outside. So I didn't know what scaffolding was really for, even in real life. So when I was told how is scaffold or asked, how is scaffolding going? I was immediately like, I, I don't even know what that word means, but I did what I had already learned that all teachers do, which is pretend that I know uh, what scaffolding is. So I was like, yeah, we are, yeah, we're scaffolding it. It, I don't know how this word is supposed to end, but we're totally doing it. And I ran across the hall and I asked Yolanda, I was like, what in the world is scaffolding? Cause I cannot, it cannot be what I think it is. Cause I think it has to do with construction. And if you think I'm giving these kids anything that could be used in construction, you're insane because I don't even trust them with really sharp pencils. So there's no way that we're doing anything to do with this. And also this is crazy. Like education is nuts. How can we be expected? And so I'm totally like spinning out and she's like, no, 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 it's fine. Scaffolding is support that leads to independence. It's, it's instructional. And I thought, great. I love the idea of support that leads to independence. I'm here for that. How do I do it? And she was like, I have no idea. And I've been pretending for a while. So why don't you find out because you're brand new and everybody knows you don't know anything. So why don't you find out and come back and tell all of us? Uh, I did not ever find out what it was at that time as a teacher. I waited several more years, actually until I was a consultant with Sidelets, to really know what scaffolding was. And it turns out I was already doing some scaffolding. I just didn't know that's what it was. So you can use scaffolding as a noun or a verb. It can be uh, as a noun. I prefer it as a noun because that's more like something that's physical that we remove. It's not the action that we're doing. It's the support itself that's that's removed. Um, these bell ringers that we're talking about today and the strategies that we're going to go through, they're a form of linguistic scaffolding, meaning they're going to provide some additional support that students need in order to be successful in the activity. Uh, and it's designed around, and the supports are designed around supporting students who speak more languages than just English at home. So for our students who are trying to build language at the same time that they're trying to build content knowledge, these types of bell ringers can serve as a really important form of scaffolding. What they do is they invite kids into the learning experience uh, with something they can be successful at and with a lot of linguistic support. So the very first thing that kids experience in that lesson as they walk into the classroom 
or as you're transitioning from another lesson, um, whenever the, they are first starting the, the lesson, these bell ringers or warmups are a way for kids to experience success, interact with people around them, because we know that interaction is key for language acquisition. So if we want to build language, students have got to be interacting in some capacity. We don't acquire language without interaction. So these uh, strategies are designed to give kids the opportunity to interact with each other in a low stress environment that's hopefully, fingers crossed, a tiny bit engaging. The good news is students don't actually expect our content to be very engaging at all. Uh, so the bar is pretty low when it comes to what passes for engagement. And all the strategies we're going to go over today definitely meet those criteria. So I'm just going to cover a few bell ringers or warm ups with y'all. But again, I encourage you to use the chat function to share other ideas for bell ringers or warm ups and other strategies that you use uh, for linguistic support so that we can really maximize our time together here and make the most of the fact that you took time out of your life to be seated in this place at this time uh, with the rest of us today and have this collaborative and shared experience. All right. Okay. Let's get started. Okay, so one of the strategies that we use is called Prediction Cafe. And the way that it works is we have students draw a piece of paper the way that I do it, have students draw a piece of paper from an envelope. So I've got an envelope that's got a bunch of different sentences cut up in it. Some of them are pictures, actually. There's captions because I've cut up a news article or there's the image that goes with the caption. Uh, but either way, kids pull something out of the envelope and they don't show it to anybody else. After they look at their strip and their of sentence or their caption or whatever, uh, then they get the opportunity to talk with two other people and they go meet with a partner and they go over what they have on their card or they describe their picture and with their partner, they make a prediction. This prediction is not based on reality. It's not based on past information. They may be drawing from some background knowledge. That's great. Uh, but it has no context in, in meaning like there's no expectation that students come up with a certain kind of prediction. The idea is just to get them thinking um, and engaged with our topic. And after they talk to a couple of different partners, then they return back to their seat and we move on. I don't have them read the whole article at that point. I like to continue the anticipation. So I'm a, a big fan of that. Oh, my earring just decided to jump out of my ear. All right, that's fine, you do that. All right, so after they partner with two different people and return to their seat, like I said, you can go over the article, but I like to leave the mystery, you know, and come back to it later. Uh, my favorite strategy to do, or sorry, article to do this with is from the 1980s uh, that I found that is a, a summary of the Cabbage Patch riots that happened in the 80s when the Cabbage Patch dolls first came out. So I have this article where it's got a picture of like Ted Koppel's disembodied head and it just says craze with a baby doll next to it. And then there's another picture on there that shows a Newsweek cover. And then there are a couple of sentences like that say things such as uh, once people were easily able to obtain the dolls, the violence subsided. You know, and then there's another sentence that just describes what a riot is. And so when these kids get up and partner, one kid's got Ted Koppel's disembodied head and another kid's got a sentence about riots and they got to try to make a prediction about how these two things are connected. Um, the odds of them being successful are slim, but it doesn't matter because the whole point of this activity is for them to get up and talk to a partner and make a prediction based on the information they have in front of them. So we're not requiring any background knowledge. We're not requiring teacher assistance during the activity. You're monitoring, but you're not engaged in the exchange of information. Uh, and all kids can complete this successfully because the way that we can adapt this for English learners, here's an example. So, oh, and this slide is in the slides that you're getting from, um, from Liz with all, you know, when you get your recording and it's got click here for slides, uh, this is in there. So you don't have to worry about capturing all of this at once. So in order to make this accessible for my beginning and newcomer English learners, I would try to make sure they end up with a picture or a simple caption, something that is accessible linguistically, preferably something that is nonverbal, so the, the image. And I would also provide them with two stems. One is my card says, and then they can just read it. Uh, or, and also, sorry, what does yours say? So that they know how to prompt their partner and they're not just staring blankly at their partner. For our intermediate English learners, we want them to have a couple of different clauses. So my card says, hmm, so I predict, hmm, because a beginning part of your sentence and then comma, so is not a natural linguistic structure that kids are going to do. We need to give them the opportunity to practice with stems so that they develop that pattern. And this is one of those stems that can be really useful in lots of different content areas. So my card says, hmm, so I predict hmm, is something that we can use all the time. 
uh, I wanted for my advanced students, I wanted to remove the verb here and just see what they do, see what kind of verb tenses happen. And then for nearly fluent uh, students, we want uh, to make it a little more complex and get some future tense in there and more complicated grammar structures. So uh, it's up to you how you would communicate these stems to students. You can use color coding and write them on the board and let students pick because normally they will self sort into the sentence that fits best for them. Um, you can tell them in advance which one you want them to use. I, it's really up to you, uh, but providing differentiated stems is a really good way to meet the different linguistic needs in that activity for all your kids um, and not just specifically your English learners. So that's one way that I like to do it because Prediction Cafe is, is a really good time. So, all right. And I think, oh, sorry, Liz, I'm pulling up the chat and there's a question about the resources. Okay. Yes, I'm on it. Thank you. Alrighty, perfect. Good. I love it when there's a problem and it's not mine. That's fantastic. I don't want you to have problems, but I'm just saying if there's going to be one and I have to pick one of us, I'm going you. No offense. Okay. So the second strategy we want to go over is uncover the picture. So uncover the picture is one of those that's useful for pre-K through high school. So the next one we're going to do, the language anticipation guide, is a little more suited for kids who can read and write independently. Uh, this one we can do with all students. We first start off with an image that is mostly obscured. We give them just a tiny, tiny sliver of the image. Uh, I have two examples for you here, one from the teaching social studies book that Liz referenced, and then one from teaching science that I co-authored with my colleague, Dr. Stephen Fleener. And you can see with the science and social studies, they're just a tiny bit different, but the general idea is the same. We're going to give kids just a part of an image and ask them to respond to a few questions. Uh, what do you see? What do you notice? What do you think? And then we're going to open up a little bit more of that image and see if their, their opinion changes. We can be really explicit here and we can ask them just to list what they see, or we can ask them to go ahead and start making predictions, making connections. And then finally, we're going to show them the entire image. And it's really interesting to see how your thinking evolves over time. So I, I really can't honestly even tell you what's happening with our science image, because that's what I have Stephen for, and that's where his brilliance comes in. Uh, so I don't even know what we would want kids to be looking for in our science image. I'm way more familiar with our social studies content. Um, and this is a, an iconic image for our students. But at the very beginning, when you look at this image, you're not expecting it to end up the way that it ends up. And uh, there's th this is a very visceral image. Uh, and you know it's obviously something that kids don't see every day. So it's a way for us to engage them with our content. And we can talk about like what circumstances in your life would lead you to be in a position where you would pass your toddler over an open body of water to whatever, the, whoever these men are, you don't even necessarily know. Um, so our kids definitely wouldn't know. And that's a great way to revisit that time period. And anyway, I can totally geek out on the history part the whole day, so I cannot do that. I have to keep moving, uh, but uncover the picture is a great strategy that, and there are a lot of different options for uh, ways you can reveal the image. In fact, if you Google this, you'll find uh, like PowerPoint slides and ways that people have adjusted the strategy to make it really engaging. So that's one of my favorites uh, to use. All right, so uncover the picture is not necessarily a language building strategy until you ask students to talk about it or write about it. That's where we're building that language. So just looking at the image and having the thoughts in their head, that's not doing any good. We've got to get them to verbalize or write about it or preferably both. Um, that would be our goal. All right. And this one is my very favorite. This is the language anticipation guide. So we're going to spend a little bit more time with this one. You can imagine why, because our goal today is building language through bell ringers, right? So using those first few minutes of class to get students to grow in their proficiency in academic English. And also we want to get them to just grow in their overall understanding of content and be better communicators. So the language anticipation guide is a really strong way to do that. And I recommend that we use this at all different levels. We can do this collaboratively as a group. Uh, we can also uh, make sure that we do it sometimes individually, so kids have to reflect on their own thinking. This language anticipation guide can be used to teach new vocabulary. It can also be very open-ended just to get kids a little bit engaged with the content. It's up to you. So let's practice this together, all right? 
Imagine that for our students, we ask them to think about in the context of today's reading. We want to make sure that we say in the context of today's reading, not just in general, because these words have multiple meanings. So in the context of our reading today, I predict dreams is another word for your hopes or goals for the future. I'm going to ask you all to go ahead and, you know, notepad somewhere around you, just grab a pen or pencil and decide whether this is true or false. All right, dreams is another word for your hopes or goals for the future. If that's true for today's reading, I'll ask you to put a T. If it's not true for today's reading, I'll ask you to put an F. I'll give you a second to decide. Okay. Here's your next one. <clears throat> the term outside is an antonym. Look at that, we're getting some ELA action in there is an antonym for indoors. The term outside is an antonym for indoors. Is that true or false in the context of today's reading? Will the word outside appear as an antonym for indoors or will it have a different meaning? True or false, okay. And then finally, the term notes means words that are written down to help you remember something. Is that true or false? And I'll give you just a minute to decide. So a couple of things are happening here. I can't explain why this person is a wizard. I don't know why that's happening, but I just really loved this image. I found this image when I was looking for uh, something that showed anticipation and prediction and wager. And so I got this awesome wizard and I have so many questions, uh, but the idea here is when we do a prediction uh, like this, where we are saying, you know, in the context of today's reading, I think that it's going to be that outside means, you know, opposite of indoors. When I have that in my mind, my brain has made a wager. My brain has said, I bet it's this. Just by engaging in that act of saying, I bet it's this, I think, I predict, it engages a part of your brain. That's the same part of your brain that would be engaged if you sat down in Vegas to play roulette next to this awesome wizard. That's the same part of your brain that's engaged when you, if you went to the betting track. So we don't want to turn our kids into gamblers. I'm not saying that. Uh, I am saying we want our kids to make predictions because for your, for your brain, it's really, really good to say, you know what I think is going to happen next? I think it's going to be this. So one thing we're doing here is engaging our students by having them make those predictions. And that just triggers a part of the brain naturally that we don't use all the time. That's why this is a really nice activity to start off our class period with. Another thing we're doing here is we're getting kid, giving kids the opportunity to interact with language that maybe they've seen this way before. So maybe it's been academic language that has been what we would call brick terms. So those are content specific academic language terms. So when we think about academic language, it's made up of two different types of language. There's content specific language, and then there's language that holds all the other words together. And that language is still academic, but it's not content specific. So what I mean here is for a language anticipation guide, it can be really useful if we say, here's, you know, table, for example, in math, table is a content specific word in social studies or in any other context, it's not. So table would be a great one to use here because I would be able to differentiate between whether this was academic language that was content specific brick terms or it's academic language that's general, that's not content specific. So this is a way for kids to engage with that different type of language. And we, we highly, highly encourage that. So that's why I love a language anticipation guide because it gives me the opportunity to have students engage with that mortar language, those terms that hold the other you know, content specific words together um, and also, if I want to, it gives me an opportunity to show kids a content specific term. So big fan of this strategy, but I made you do a language anticipation guide. So your brain is now asking like, okay, that's great lady, but like, tell me which, whether I was right or not. That's what you want to know. Okay. So I've got a little reading for you. I'm going to pause for a second, give you a break from my voice. It doesn't mean that I'm frozen or I've gone away. I just want to give you a minute to read through these couple of paragraphs and see if you can find those terms that we just did our language anticipation guide around. And I'll show you one more time. Our terms were dreams, outside, and notes, right? Dreams, outside, and notes. All right, you ready? Here we go. I'll give you just a minute to read through this.
So I know you didn't have time to read the whole thing, but you also didn't sign up today to sit and, you know, watch me watch you read. Uh, so I will lead you straight to where these terms are. Um, one of our terms, when we see dreams, we know right away when we start reading, oh, this isn't that kind of dreams from our language anticipation guide. These dreams are about the dreams you have at night when you sleep. That's very different. And we need to clarify that for our kiddos. Uh, we also find pretty quickly the, the notes part is totally different because Paul McCartney isn't rushing to the piano to jot down his grocery list. He's going to the piano to figure out the musical notes. So those are different. So my brain would pick up on, oh, there's notes. Oh, I got it wrong. That's all right. And then finally, the word outside. This is where I'm bringing in that mortar language I was talking about. If you look in the conclusions paragraph, it says outside of that. And that doesn't mean outdoors. That's a very common uh, academic language phrase that if I'm an English learner and I read that and I think outside of that, I'm like, outside of what, where, where are we? Like, when did this become a physical location? I don't recognize that as an academic language phrase of outside of that comma, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's one of the things I wanted to draw attention to by putting it in a language anticipation guide because it's most common usage and understanding that my English learners would have come up with first is not actually how it's used in this context. This is a mortar phrase that's outside of that, yada, yada, yada. If they start to internalize that, they can absolutely use it in other contexts. So when they start writing an, an ELA essay and they say, well, outside of blah, 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 that sounds so good. It makes them seem so articulate and intelligent and really impacts how they are seen by others and themselves. So I love the power of that language anticipation guide. All right, so let's go ahead and rate yourself again. So was dreams another word for your hopes or goals for the future? Mm, nope, not today, it wasn't. Uh, what about the term outside is an antonym for indoors? Not in today's activity. And the term notes means words that are written down to help you remember something, not today. So you notice all of mine were false. You gotta mess with your kids. Sometimes make them all false, sometimes make them all true, sometimes mix them up. Um, you wanna make sure you're not predictable with this. We also get in a habit often of, doing like true, false, true, just watch yourself for those patterns uh, and make sure that you change it up and keep them guessing so that they uh, retain that incentive, right? To make that bet in their brain. All right, so good job. Don't forget your roulette wizard and your brick and mortar language. It's very, very important. So I wanna pause right here and just give y'all a second to respond in the chat. So far, uh, we've talked about Prediction Cafe. We've talked about Language Anticipation Guide. Uh, and we talked about uncover the picture. That was the second one. Out of those three, I just wanna hang out in the chat for a second and think about like, which of those do you think you're most likely to implement if you're not using them already? So out of those three that we've gone over so far, uh, or that we, we're gonna go over, we're not going over anymore. Uh, out of those three, which of them do you think you're most likely to utilize? And I'll give you guys just a second to respond to that in the chat. Which one sticks out to you as something that would be easiest to implement in your world? It looks like language anticipation guide is uh, winning the race here. Yeah, I think it's getting a boost from the wizard. I think that like, I think <laughs> <laughs> and the amount of effort I put into it too. I think it's getting a boost, but I agree. Language anticipation guides are really where it's at. How many, I want to go back and scroll through here. How many uncover the pictures do we have? Because that that's the one that I would pick. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, this is, yeah. I'm probably telling on myself by by sharing this. But when I look at these three and I think about implementation, which one is the easiest road to implementation? To me, it's uncover the picture because I can just grab a, it, it takes me what, 30 seconds to find a picture that can generate language and then I just cover it up. Um, so that's the quickest entry point into doing these. In my opinion, language anticipation guide, I think that is, has maybe more, um, more, you can get more mileage out of it maybe, but it requires more prep time. So that's not one that I would start with. I would want to ease my way into it, but that's probably more information than you all need to know, but that, that's just my, no, that's my two cents. Perfect. No, that's absolutely perfect. You're absolutely right. I think that that that's huge. And also you're, you're playing on the 
uh, the side of the road that's non-linguistic representation of information. And so as we're building language, it's kind of counterintuitive, but as we're building language, one of the best ways we can do that is to use something that's not language-based, something that's non-linguistic, because the brain stores information both of those ways, linguistically and non-linguistically. So in order for us to build that language, even as language is a barrier and a challenge, uh, we can use those images. So like Liz is saying, even though that is one of the uh, easier, more accessible strategies, it's also one of the most powerful because we can have students respond to the visual even when they're not able to fully respond uh, verbally or in written form about those same ideas or concepts. So I think that's really, really powerful. Um, and I, I see comments also in the in the chat that's a really good point when we're doing virtual teaching this non-linguistic representation can be super super helpful uh, because when we're doing uh, this virtual in the virtual setting you're less able to interact with your students while they're doing the activity and offer that in the moment support so it helps to make the content itself as comprehensible as possible and for many of our students a visual is more comprehensible um, than the written word and that's what we're working on so that's a great point yeah, and Liz, always jump in and share your perspective because I think it's really valuable. And I also think a lot of people come to all these webinars and they hardly get to hear you. So you're very mysterious. And I, like <laughs> I don't think I'm that mysterious, but I mean, maybe. <laughs> no, I like to let them know. Anyway, okay. We should, you know, I'm just saying maybe we can collaborate sometime. I don't know. We already started yeah. dressing alike. If you haven't noticed, I tried to mimic you today. I tried to dress alike. I was like, what would Liz wear? All Something right. black. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I know, sorry, I have it on a totally blank screen right now because I, I don't have a visual that goes with this after this whole speech about the importance of visuals. Um, but one of the things that I love most about doing a bell ringer or a warm up is it's an opportunity for a reset. It's a reset for you. It's a reset for the students. It's an opportunity to say, no matter what's going on in our world or what has happened, what has transpired in your day since you woke up or what has happened in the world this week, in this moment, we're about to engage in some type of lesson or activity. And we're gonna take a second to all get ready for that experience because when students walk into their classrooms, they don't immediately go, oh, well, I've stepped over the threshold into this classroom. I'm going to leave every concern I have and all my like worries and, you know, all that behind me. I'm just going to focus on what's happening right now in my world cultures class. That's really my only focus. Uh, that's not what happens. They come in from the passing period, bring in all that drama and everything that's on their mind. And if they're hungry or whatever, that's what we're thinking about when we first come into the room. We do it too. You walk into the classroom, you're like, oh, I forgot to send that email. Didn't get a chance to go to the bathroom. Guess I'll be doing that three hours from now. So this warm up or bell ringer is a chance for us to all reset. It's also an opportunity for students to experience success. And a lot of our kids who need to build language and, and a lot of the students who caused you to wanna to come to the session today, they don't experience a ton of success in the general day as they move through the world. So when they go from class to class and things are challenging or frustrating, it can be hard to walk into your room and also be like ready to start and ready to engage and ready to try. So if we start off with something like that prediction cafe or that uncover the picture, um, and we give them the opportunity to engage in a low stress activity that helps them to get ready for today's lesson, that's a good way to lower their affective filter, that affective with an A, to lower that filter and, and give them the opportunity to get ready to learn what it is you have to teach. And the way I like to talk about this is to think about, imagine your students, by the time we start our lesson, they're all on the same page. That's the turn of phrase we use all the time. I want all my kids on the same page. Friend, when they come in the library, they're not even like, they're not even in the library. Let's not even say they're in the library yet. When they walk into the building, you're still trying to get them into your library. We can't get them on the same page until we've gotten them into the library. Then we're gonna get them into the same book we're all reading, and then we're gonna get on the same page. So the bell ringer or warm up is us saying, come in here to this space, let us get ready for a lesson together and some new content, new information. But first, I'm gonna turn your brain at least uh, to the on position. So you are ready through this engaging activity to build a little language and, and maybe some background knowledge even, and then we'll move into our new content. But it's an opportunity for all of us to experience some success and reset before the content starts. That is essential for our English learners. Feeling comfortable in your learning environment is an essential component of acquiring new language or new content information. So if I don't feel comfortable in the classroom, I'm not gonna learn. 
And this warm up or this bell ringer is a really great opportunity for me to have that first experience and be successful. All right. Okay. So I have three sentence stems for you here. Would you please choose one, whichever one speaks to your heart, and complete one of those stems in our chat at this time? All right. Would you please choose one of these, whichever one speaks to your heart, and complete that in our chat right now? I'll give you just a minute to do this, and then I'm going to give you my own answers too. So if there's one of these that's not working for you, uh, that's okay. Uh, I will help you with that in just a moment, but please choose one of these and respond. All right, they're starting to come in. It always takes a minute because everybody's typing the whole stem and then they're filling it in. There we go. It is so stressful. It's just like in real life when you ask a question <laughs> and none of the kids say anything and like your heart just drops into your <laughs> and you think like, what is my function? Did I, I mean, why do I try? They're not even, <laughs> and then it all comes in and you're like, I shouldn't have doubted. These are great responses. I love that notion of the reset. Yeah. I love that. It's so important. It is so important. Yeah, and so I want to uh, I want to give you guys a few responses that I came up with, and then I want to address the questions that have come in in the Q and A, and a couple of them that have come in um, during the chat as well. So y'all keep submitting these because they're awesome. I just want to be a part of the conversation. So here are a few that I came up with. Not to say that most of yours aren't better, because they are, uh, but here's what I had to offer the group. So it seems like a really small thing, but it's one of those really small things that makes a big difference. Those first few minutes really set the tone for the rest of your class period. And if we can open up those brains and lower the heart rate a little bit and let kids kind of settle in, like even as I'm talking about this and thinking about it, I am like sitting back in my seat and lowering my shoulders and taking a breath. And if we do this consistently, we can trigger those behaviors in our students as well. And one more benefit I wanna offer, specifically thinking about um, our students who are dealing with stress about whether they've been just a struggling academic student in general, or they're struggling with language challenges or just emotional drama of, of being the, a human, like we all have stuff going on, right? Um, when I give them this consistency and every day we do some kind of warm up, whether it is a prediction cafe or whatever, it doesn't always have, it's not always gonna be the same, but they know that when we walk in, we're gonna do something like this for the first few minutes and that structure is consistent. That makes a huge difference in students feeling comfortable. Uh, we all rely on structure and routine to feel comfortable. As a human being, you need structure in your life. It helps you not always be on high stress alert when you know, okay, every time I go to this class, this is how it's going to start. You, then your brain is able to focus more on the content and less on the procedure. So I know that I'm going to do a bell ringer. All I need to know is what today's specific instructions are but the, the expectation and the support is going to be consistent. And I know when I walk into this class, I gotta be ready to go for minute one because this teacher doesn't play. They're not wasting any time. They're gonna use all their instructional minutes, uh, even those first two to 10. So that's why I love using warmups uh, to really set that tone and that expectation and give kids that comfort because so many things are not structured the way they used to be and are not consistent right now for us and for our kids. Like if we can at least hang our hat on warmups, that's a start. So Liz, can we go over some of the questions now? Which one do you think we should start with? Well, let's see, we have a couple. Um, let's actually start with Molly's question, which is she's working in special education and has some students with a variety of language processing disorders. So do you think the two to 10 minute rule would apply there? Um, or can we be flexible on that for those students who need maybe a little bit more processing time? How long is too long? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, and then I'm going to give the universal answer of, well, it depends, Molly. Um, it depends because I'm trying to decide if the student is 
if I'm, I'm talking about a student and it's more of an inclusion situation and I've got 20 kids in the room and I've got two beginner English learners and one kid with a language processing uh, challenge and I want to make sure that all of my kids are able to complete the activity by the end of the activity, then I'm gonna offer similar accommodations to my special education student that I would offer to my English learner. And I'm gonna hope, I'm gonna hope that your teachers on your campus are coming to you for that support and to say, what could this look like? Here's my language anticipation guide. How should I modify this so that this student is able to be successful at the, at the same pace as the rest of my class? So that's one way to do it, like adjust the activity so that they can complete it during that time. Uh, another option is if you're doing this with a group of students who would all benefit from extended time, then take that time. Absolutely. If it's something that all kids will benefit from and take 20 minutes, it's, it, that's totally fine. As long as we are meeting the needs of that, most of that group, does that make sense? Um, so we adjust the task more if we want the student to be able to complete it at, on pace with other kids in an inclusion situation. And we lengthen the time period if we want kids to have the full experience and we're not worried about the pacing impacting the pacing of the, the whole entire class. Does that make sense, Liz, the way I said that? It does, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, I love that she brought that question to us because we have to acknowledge that um, even, I guess, in a sense that even the bell ringers will need to be differentiated depending on the, the circumstances and that's okay. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh, and so, and that's something we talk about like in, in both of the books that, that we have there, the science and the social studies, every activity is differentiated by language level and we do shorten the language anticipation guide or offer visuals and other support for beginner and, and even intermediate English learners. Um, the good thing about a language anticipation guide is everybody's guessing. So there's no real like threat there. Uh, but for the others, we definitely want to adjust to make it possible for kids to complete the activity successfully in a similar time frame as the rest of their peers, unless we're going to be working with a group of kids where we're not held to that same kind of constraint. And then we can take it slowly and really give them the full benefit of the activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, Robert, who is our loyal uh, webinar attendee, he brought up in the chat and in the question area a couple of different um, strategies. And I don't know we'll be able to answer these questions um, exactly, but one thing he brought up was Raft, which I believe is a writing framework, mm -hmm. um, and then the QSSA. Now, where would those could are those bell ringer material or are they yeah, a, a little bit yeah. too um, too lengthy to be bell ringers? What do you Good think? Good question. Um, QSSA can be a great accompaniment to our bell ringers. It's a strategy we use at Sidelets and uh, Robert knows this because he has attended Sidelets trainings too. Uh, and he always keeps me on my toes. So uh, we use that QSSA. We can use that for the uncover the picture. We can, we can definitely use that where we ask students, you know, what do you see in this first part? Give me a signal, like a thinker's chin. So like this, when you can name three things in this picture, move your hand away from your chin when you have your answer. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to find three things in this picture, move my hand. Okay. Now I'm going to turn and talk to a partner. That's the share piece. And I'm going to, in that share piece, I'm going to use a stem. So that's where we're covering a couple of those S's in QSSA. I'm going to share with my friend. Uh, what do you see? What do I see? And then the teacher's going to call on a kid randomly and say, name three things in this item. Absolutely. We can do that. The only thing is the QSSA is teacher structured. Like it's, it's pretty teacher centered in the sense that you have to take them through each step. So it's a little more hands-on than say having kids complete the language anticipation guide while you also check attendance. So it's one of those things that you have to kind of plan for, but yeah, absolutely. It can be incorporated. Raft, I would say is different. Raft is a writing strategy, uh, role audience format and topic where we adjust students uh, into different roles or to writing to a different audience or using a different format or about a different topic and get students to write um, similar but different responses. So I love that strategy and it is in the social studies book, but it's not something I would do as a warm up necessarily. Uh, but you know, no reason why you, you couldn't for sure. If you want to, let me think about it. Um, yeah, you could do that, but you would have to assign the kids all their parts already. And I don't know, that's a lot of work for me and Liz who like to just pull up an image and be like, what do you see? I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I love raft and I love raft for differentiating for different um, audiences or different topics or whatever for kids and making it accessible. So I can have one kid write an essay and I can have one kid write an email and I can have one kid write a bulleted list and it's, you know, about the same topic and I'll get completely different content. So 
Yeah. So that's great. I'm glad you shared that because um, he actually mentioned social emotional learning in, in his question. And I think um, I'm just anticipating what you could possibly say about SEL, but Raft, but I mean, seeing things from different perspectives and different roles, I think is a, is a nice, easy fit there for uh, taking an SEL angle on Raft. Yeah. So yeah. And also um, like you can do it in terms of like, what is your, your role? What are you, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to persuade somebody? Are you writing a letter to the editor to persuade them? Um, are you trying to explain to somebody why you feel a certain way? So that works really well in social studies or in ELA when we're, we're going to ask kids, um, you know, imagine that you are, you know, so-and-so this historical figure, uh, why don't you put yourself in their position and write a diary entry about how your day went? So I'm teaching kids empathy in that way, put yourself in their shoes um, is a great way to do that. So I love that strategy and the question, but yeah, not super great for bell ringers necessarily, uh, just because kids also have a lot of stress and frustration around writing. So the last thing I, I think I want to mm -hmm. do is have them sit down and be like, oh, I don't want to do this. And then like, yeah, that's, that's not what we're going for. So I would save that until I've gotten a little more buy-in from them a little bit later in the activity. Right. Okay. And I think those were the two that stood out to me. I want to give everybody um, just another minute of think time to add any questions either to the chat or the Q and A. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take the screen back here and let everybody know what's coming up next week. Cause I always need to let you know who's on deck. Oh, so, oh wait, 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 before you do that. Sorry. Yeah. Can uh -oh. I Real, real quick thing about yeah. the science training that, that Stephen and I have coming up. Cause that was on my last. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Let me, do, there you go. Oh no, I don't want it back. Oh, now it's all, I'm all stressed. You don't want it back? No, it's okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say it, but this is fine too. Um, yeah. So uh, we have an upcoming uh, virtual conference on October 5th. If you want to talk about science specifically for supporting English learners, I just wanted to say that that was there and then put the social media stuff up one more time. Okay. Now I'm done. Okay. So yeah. this is where you can find out more about that. Um, event that Tina is referring to. Definitely check it out. We need to get Stephen on. Uh, I don't know if he watches these webinars, but Stephen, I'm going to be calling you. Okay. So <laughs> get ready, get prepared. All right. Now let's go that back to way more menacing than you meant. You were like, Oh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> you think threats will work with him? No, I'm just kidding. So. Yeah. He's also <laughs> motivated like me. So. Okay. I don't threaten anybody. Um, I, I like to pretend that I'm tough, but I'm really not. Okay, so <laughs> next week we have Coffee with Katie and Richard. Now, if you've been watching our webinars for any length of time, you know that uh, Katie and Richard, they, we have them on every six weeks-ish, uh, and they um, have their own kind of webinar series that they do together called Coffee with Katie and Richard, and they're going to be um, coming to Saddleback's house to do that. Uh, we're, they're going to be doing that on our platform, uh, and the topic is going to be creative and critical thinking for uh, through reading, writing, and speaking. Now, please note the time on this. We want to try a little something new here, two o'clock Pacific, five o'clock Eastern time. I don't know that this is going to be a regular thing, but we definitely want to try it out. Maybe a little bit uh, a later webinar might be better for some people. So uh, join us next week with Katie and Richard, five o'clock Eastern time. You can register on our website, or if you're on the email list, you'll be getting an email uh, with a link to the registration as well. Um, please be sure to check out our new Go ELL Tween Literacy Library. Every week I like to shout out a Saddleback product. So this is the one this week. This, these are our content focused genres, accessible text. So first to second grade readability, great for beginners, but also lots of good vocabulary in there. Lots of academic vocabulary, lots of content vocabulary too, because these stories are rooted in particular genres. So we've got um, a lot of great science words, a lot of great math vocabulary, uh, and just beautiful books. So please check them out. Shoot me an email if you want to talk about them. I can send you some e-samples. Just let me know. All right, so let's see if we had any more questions. No more questions added to the Q&A, so everybody must be satisfied. All right, last call for questions, everybody. Thanks, Victor. Thanks for coming, Robert. Oh, I'm glad you liked it, Monica. This was a good, I love this. This is a nice, uh, you have lots of ideas. You leave this webinar with lots of good ideas, things you can try tomorrow, which is perfect. Oh, everybody really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Awesome. I hope you're enjoying all the love in the chat, Tina. 
oh, you know, I can't actually accept a compliment, but I feel it like bouncing off of the shield that I put up around myself. Oh, <laughs> well, it's there. It's coming your no, way. Really shield or not. Great. I can't not be like, even if this had crashed and burned, the fact that Miss Cowan was here, like, I mean, my fifth grade teacher showed up y'all. That's amazing. How cool is it? I actually thought about her the other week. And I was like, man, I wish I knew how to get in touch with her. She really made an impact on my life. And then she just pops up asking questions through Liz. It was amazing. That's crazy. That's crazy. So we're not quite done yet because, um, uh, Leticia has a question, um, about uncover the picture. She had to duck out into the hallway and she sort of missed that piece. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, do you mind, we ha- do you have a couple minutes to go back over that? Yeah, I'm good. I would okay. love to. Let's do, do it. you need the slides? Let me stop share so you can yeah. show the picture. It's a really fun one. I think you'll like it. <laughs> yeah, let me grab it. Let me just, give me just one second. This is why I love our live audience because yeah. they're, they're here. They're going to take advantage of it. I love well, that. Yeah, and it's dynamic and it, yeah, I think that's awesome. So let's just put it back on this slide. So on the uncover the picture, it really is exactly what it sounds like. It's very, very straightforward. You need to choose an image that develops over kind of over time. Like it, uh, there needs to be either multiple points of action or a, a little bit of a reveal to it, if that makes sense. Like you wouldn't want to do this with like a piece of, you know, art that's just a fruit bowl. Like there's nothing happening there. In both of these examples, in the science one, it looks like it's marshmallows and then it gets to the bottom and it's stuck into a brain. Like that's weird, man. You want to know about that or it's stuck into something. I don't know what that is. And then in the social studies one, we start out with just a sliver of a boat and a man leaning over the side. And then we get to the middle and what he's leaning over the side with is a human child that's just now floating over the open water headed to a pair of arms. And we make predictions about that. And then we see that, oh, let's look at this. Like this, this kid is being, what's happening? Is this kid's going on to a different boat with all these people? What, what is the situation here? So the image has to have something about it that is either surprising or interesting or unexpected. Um, this works super well in social studies showing, you know, different, like you can have a whole battle scene and you can show just a part of it and let it grow. Lots of different stuff we can do with this strategy, but we just pause at intervals and have kids uh, respond to the visual, make predictions, and try to guess what's going to happen next. I love this one. I love it. So picture, just expose it a little bit at a time. Has to be a compelling picture, right? Uh, and obviously something that's related to uh, what's coming, preferably. Um, mm-hmm. I guess it doesn't have to be, right? If it's going to be yeah, a bell ringer, but, mm-hmm. um, but it's fun. Like I can't imagine a class not getting into this because everybody wants to know what's in the picture and it does get them talking. So you definitely um, get that language aspect in there. So I hope that helps. Um, and uh, this recording will be available so you can go back and check it out or um, let me know if you have any further questions and we can get those answered for you. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. Perfect. All right, so um, can we just take a moment? I know everybody's ready to go, but I just need to take a moment to like reiterate to everybody that Tina's fifth grade teacher that she hadn't talked to in years, but had just thought of recently, like, oh, she really made an impact on my life. And I wonder what she's up to. She came to this webinar and was like, hey, Tina, I'm so proud of you. It's so good to see you. And it was, it's, it was a moment. So um, (laughs) it was a moment. One of those moments that makes you think the universe might be a simulation because you're like, I (sighs) I manifested this somehow. Like, I mean, how did I make her appear? And in the moment that I needed her, because you know, Liz knows I have a lot of anxiety around webinars or anything that's publicly broadcast uh, because, you know, I have no filter and I'm always afraid that this is going to be the time that I, you know, do something or say something I shouldn't or whatever. Uh, so I had all that anxiety this morning and then I got that message. And I also, uh, you know, Mr. Kim had written a couple of questions that I knew him and I know Liz and she, I know she's going to take care of me, but it just was this nice, like warm, yeah. Hug right before we started. Yeah. It was so cool. So, cool. and, and you know what, you did a great job. You don't have anything to worry about and everybody loved it. Yeah. Um, so we appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to share on our platform again. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you next week uh, with uh, Katie and Richard a little bit later in the day. Uh, Take care, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye, Tina. Bye.